All right, so once again, I'm recording this in a hotel room, so which is near an airport, so it's going to be loud and noisy, but whatever. So, um, we want to prove that the class of measurable functions is the smallest class containing both simple functions and which is closed under pointwise limits. And so basically, I'm just sort of going to talk through this exercise. Um, so the first thing is that we have to show that um, certainly simple functions are measurable because if you take a simple function of this form and you take the inverse image of any Borel set in R, what you do is you take the collection of all CIs which belong to this Borel set and you take the union of the corresponding AIs and that's a union of measurable sets and that's it's or union of Borel sets, and thus it's Borel, and so there you are. Well, I guess not Borel, but the these um, measurable these so these are f measurable. So you take a Borel set in R, um, and look at all the C's that belong to them, and then you take the unions of the corresponding AIs, and so you end up with the union of sets in f, which is therefore an f, and so the inverse image of any Borel set is in F, which means that the function is, that um, simple functions are measurable. So, um, the class of S, F measurable functions certainly contains the simple functions, um, but we want to show that it's the uh, smallest class containing simple functions and closed under pointwise limits. So what we want to prove is suppose that we have a class of functions which contains simple functions and which is closed under pointwise limits, we want to prove that this class of functions contains the class of f measurable functions. And so essentially what we need to do is it suffices to prove that any f measurable function is in this particular class of functions which contains the simple functions and is closed under pointwise limits. And so the way we do that is that we take any measurable function and we need to be able to express it as a pointwise limit of simple functions. And if that's possible, then that measurable function is in this class of functions because the class of function, we're assuming it to be con uh, containing all the simple functions and being closed under pointwise limits. And so for this exercise, I really don't think that this should be an exercise. This is pretty tricky, and it typically appears in textbooks as a theorem, and it's really important. So I really think this should have been included in the actual text, um, but for some reason it's here as a exercise. And so in order to prove this, I'm actually going to just look at Fallen's proof of this. So this is a theorem. I've literally just copied and pasted this from Fallen's textbook. Was it uh, mathematical analysis or real analysis and application? Something. It's 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 Gerald Fallen's analysis textbook that goes over the basics of measure theory. And so we have this theorem, which gives us what we want. So part A says that for any measurable function taking positive values, there is a sequence of simple functions which converge to the measurable function pointwise. Um, the, the uniform convergence on any set which is bounded, blah, 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 that's not really important. And then part B tells us that it, this is not only true for functions which map into which take on positive values, but also functions which take on complex numbers. And of course, that's not what we're trying to prove here. All we're trying to prove is uh, we want to prove this for functions which map into R. But if it holds for functions which map into C, then it certainly holds for functions which map into R. Because the idea here, if you look at the proof of B, is that you take your function and you write it as a sum. You, you sort of break it into the positive and negative and real and imaginary parts. And then you apply part A to these four individual pieces. 
and then you combine them. Um, so really all we need to prove is a, and this is a really tricky construction to find this uh, sequence of simple functions. And so it it's shown here, and it's really, if you're just looking at this formula, it's really difficult to understand, but if you look at this picture, in my opinion, it becomes immediately clear what you what it is. So for phi n, what you do is you sort of, you have this cap on this function, so you only consider um, points on the um, function which map up to a maximum of, what, 2 to the n? And then if you're in between that, then you look at the, um, you sort of break the range of, you, you take the interval from 0 to 2 to the n and you break it up into intervals of size 2 to the minus n and take the inverse image of those sets and use that to construct this function. And so what you end up with is you end up with a bunch of squares. Like looking at the graph, you end up with squares that lie underneath them. And as you increase n, the, the squares get higher and higher. And the um, yeah, you could. I, I, it's it's difficult to describe. You can just look at the picture and see what's happening, and you can look at the formulas. And so, certainly, each v n is a simple function. Uh, to prove that it's strictly increasing, what you basically do is you 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 look at any point, which is I'm going to go into more detail on this in. Um, exercise 1.4.2, so you can look at that when I post it um, for more details. But the idea is that if you have a point which is in the set E and K, then it's going to be in E n plus 1 and then s some other, you replace K with some other possible values. And you look at what could possibly happen, and you see that either this the image of this point under phi n plus 1 is either going to be the same as the image under phi n or it's going to increase. It'll never decrease. And that's because if you look at this phi n, you're taking the indicator. So these chi's here, um, these, are the, these are indicator functions. Um, Fallen likes to use chi, um, but Duret obviously doesn't because chi is a common probability distribution. Um, so we look so E N K is the inverse image of the interval from two from um, K times two to the minus N to K plus one times two to the minus N. And when we put it into this function we we put it at K times two to the minus N. And so we're using the low the lowest possible value on this um, interval. And so when you increase, when you make your, uh, when you increase n, it's, it's either going to stay there or go up. Um, yeah, I'm not really explaining that really clearly, but I'll explain it in more detail in that further exercise. But um, through this, and just from looking at figure 2.1 over here, you can see that phi n is going to be less than or equal to phi n plus 1. And then also 0 is less than or equal to f minus vn, which is, strict, which is less than or equal to 2 to the minus n. So what that does is this is going to sh give us pointwise convergence. So certainly if, um, if you have a point where f evaluates to infinity, then the limit is going to be infinity because then this point will be in fn for all n and so it will map to 2 to the n for all n, and so that will go to infinity, which is essentially pointwise convergence to infinity. As for pointwise convergence um, to any finite number, what we see is that um, if you take f minus vn, um, this f minus vn cannot be any larger than 2 to the minus n, because vn because by the construction of Vn, it maps any point, 
if you you take any point which maps under f to somewhere in the interval k times 2 to the minus n, k plus 1 times 2 to the minus n, and it maps it instead to k 2 to the minus n. So the, the largest possible difference there could be the entire length of this interval, which is precisely 2 to the minus n. And so if you want to get within epsilon of uh, the, if you want to get within epsilon of a pointwise limit in, on a, at a point where f evaluates to a finite number, then you simply choose n large enough so that 2 to the minus n is less than epsilon. Um, and so therefore we have a sequence of, and this happens to be an increasing function, and that will be useful later when we look at um, things like, dom that makes things like dominated convergence a little bit easier to deal with. Um, we'll deal with that in the next section. Um, but anyways, um, we see that this is a, the phi ends are a sequence of simple functions which converge pointwise to this measurable function. Therefore, every measurable function, well, to this positive valued measurable function, and so any positive valued measurable function can be written as a uh, limit of simple functions. And then given any arbitrary measurable function which maps into R, you break it into the positive and negative part. That's discussed a little bit in the textbook. Um, if not, I'm pretty sure it is if it's discussed later in the textbook, or if you're not sure, you can look in Fallings as well. And it talks about how you take your function and you write it as positive part minus negative part, and then um, you just take the two sim you take the two simple function sequences that converge to these two um, measurable to converge to these two measurable functions, and then you add them together, and this gives you a sequence of sim of simple sum of simple functions which converges to the measurable function in question. And so yeah, therefore every measurable function which maps into R is a can be written as a pointwise limit of simple functions, or, yeah. So therefore, if you have a class of functions which contains simple functions and which is closed under pointwise limits, then this class also contains any measurable function. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. And so even though I didn't really give a full detailed proof, and ended up just sort of essentially saying, look at Falland, we've still finished the exercise.